Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, our third Dean's Lecture for 2016. I acknowledge the elders, the families, the descendants of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of these lands for many generations, and I acknowledge the land on which we meet today was the place of age-old ceremonies of celebration, of initiation and renewal, and the local Aborigine people have had and continue to have a unique role in the life of this university. Uh, I must say a couple of housekeeping things first. Uh, please ensure your phones are off or are on silent. Second, we record each lecture in the Dean's Lecture Series and we make these available on a website and it usually takes two or three days. Uh, we also conclude each lecture with refreshments and I do hope that you can stay and enjoy some of those refreshments uh, up on the ground floor. So tonight's a special, special night indeed. It is the biennial Jack Keating Memorial Lecture, and I'm de delighted that in the front row, I've got Jack's son Liam, his daughter Bon, and his daughter-in-law Lauren uh, here this evening. Laniel is wafting around in the Europe somewhere, enjoying a holiday, but she couldn't come back just for the night. But tonight's lecture is presented in partnership with the Australian College of Educators, uh, they, I, and I do thank them for the ongoing support that and the partnership we have for this particular event. Jack was a fellow of the Australian College of Educators. He was also a professor of education policy and leadership in the graduate school. This memorial lecture, I think, is a fitting way to honour Jack's substantial contribution to education along, and along with the Jack Keating Fund, it is a formal trust that supports policy research in the field of education and social justice with a social justice focus, something that Jack was very passionate about indeed. And I'm particularly thankful for the gener generous support we receive from many people, and particularly from the Jack Keating Fund Advisory Committee, uh, many of whom are here tonight, and I just want to wa warmly welcome you as well. And last year, we were able to award the first, the inaugural Jack Keating Scholarship, uh, and just last month, we awarded the second, and I think this is very exciting indeed. So tonight, I'm delighted to have a very special lecture to be presented by our laureate, Professor, Professor John Hattie, who is director of our Melbourne Education Research Institute. But obviously, his first really influential 2008 book, Visible Learning, the synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses relating to achievement, is believed to be the world's largest evidence-based study into the factors which improve student learning. Now, I've just had this updated, so the figures that I give you now are accurate as of 10 minutes ago. His research now involves more than 500 million students from around the world and bringing together 75,000 smaller studies. This groundbreaking study, he does update it every week, I think. Uh, this groundbreaking study found positive teacher-student interaction as the most important factor in effective teaching. But John has a number of other hats. He's chair of the Australian Institute of Teaching and School Leadership, also referred to as AITSL, through which he provides national leadership in promoting excellence so that teachers and school leaders have maximum impact on learning. And there's a particular focus at the moment on initial teacher education. He's also past president of the International Test Commission and associate editor of the British Journal of Educational Psychology, American Journal of Educational Research Journal, and others. Significantly, he was awarded the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2011 uh, Queen's Birthday Honours. He is a fellow of the Australian Council of Educational Leaders and a fellow of the American Psychological Association. Now, here's the latest update. He's widely published over 500 papers uh, and now, over t uh, now about 23 single and co-authored books. Now, this is the latest one. He has proudly supervised, as of tonight, 192 thesis students, and tomorrow it'll be 193. With such an impressive wealth of experience, it's no surprise that tonight's lecture on improving schools sold out in less than 24 hours. I'm delighted that Professor Diane Mayer, President-elect of the Australian College of Educators and Dean of Education and Social Work at the University of Sydney, is here, and I've asked her to move a vote of thanks at the conclusion 
of John's lecture. So could you now all please join me in welcoming John to the front. And I'll see if I'm in for surprises. No, timing is great. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the Keating family for being here this evening. Thank you very much for my family for being here this evening. And thank you for being here. I have, um, I want to start with some very wise words and therefore they're not from me. And I want to talk from the first four or five wordy slides according the gospel according to Jack Keating. My argument tonight is it's time for a reboot. You know when you have your computer and things are not working very well, but you've got a lot of precious stuff on it. And so you go along and they say, we're going to reboot. And so they reboot the machine and then things work hopefully very smoothly. Similarly in Australian education, we have a lot of things going extremely well. But I want to paint the picture that there is a lot of stuff around the peripherals, around the narrative, which is the core of what we do, that is actually going in the wrong direction. And doing more of the same is not in our best interests. Jack summed it up very well when he argued that instead of promoting greater diversity, our secondary schools find themselves ch chasing the same academic pot of gold in a market of which being academic is the prime indicator of market value. There is limited incentive for schools to develop vocational or alternative or personalised learning models. Then the government sector is also forced to privilege an academic curriculum in order to compete with the private sector, particularly for middle class and high achieving students. The narrative of success that Jack talked about leads to a focus on differences between schools and the argument we've had in this country for the last 10 or 15 years about school choice and the right of parents to choose school. This, as Jack demonstrated, leads to a major residualization of our public school system as more of our parents who are chasing that success academic pot of gold move out of the government school sector. And it's interesting over the last 16 years that Australia has had a far sharper social stratification than any other of the OECD countries. This leads to kind of a perverse situation where our low income students face greater obstacles to educational achievement because they're now in more of the residualized schools. And at the same time, we have more cruising schools serving our better off students. There ain't many winners in that equation. Time for a reboot. And what I want to argue this evening is instead, we should focus our effort and resources on supporting the expertise amongst our teachers and school leaders to work together to add at least a year's growth for a year's input. And I make it very clear that the debate about what a year's input, year's growth for a year's input should be one that we should be having. If I had to sum up what I see as one of the biggest problems in our school sector is teachers do not have a common conception of progress. They answer that question of what a year's growth is so variably, and it should not be a random crapshoot that every time a kid hits a teacher, random whether they go up or down, depending on that particular teacher's belief of what a year's growth looks like. And to do that, we need to build on a narrative of expertise and value it. We need to work together and open classrooms to become collaborative. We need to target resources at need, and I'll come back to that, and we need to accept evidence, an easy statement to make. But evidence is a contested word. And there are many instances where evidence does not drive our policy. And also ask always how we evaluate that, that progress in a transparent way. Given this is political season, I thought I'd have a chance at saying what my five goals were. I know in the education state that we live in here in Victoria, we started off with many, many goals. It got down to about 10. As Stephen and others know, I thought that was about five too many. And these are the five I would put up the top front about how we can build confidence in our school system. There is a continuing trend to say the quality of education in the country is going backwards. But at the same time, we say, say that the quality of education my kid gets is very good. How do we change the rhetoric to not assume that we necessarily have a bad system. The second is 
By age eight, I want to argue tonight that if kids don't get at least level two in NAPLAN and reading and maths, they are left behind. In fact, I think level two is a bit too low, but I'll use that. Evidence that schools are inviting place to come, and I want to look at the retention rate. Having multiple ways to be excellent. At the moment, we narrowly prescribe what excellence is in many of our school curricula, and that says to many kids, this is not a place for you unless you agree to this particular canon of what we think is excellence. And every school should have at least one highly accomplished or lead teacher. I want to come back to these. We had a seminar a few weeks ago called Australia, the World's Biggest Loser. Great title. And whether you like PISA or not, the politicians do. The parents look at it at least once a year in the newspapers. And we are one of the few countries that has systematically gone backwards for the last 12 years in a row. Not just relative other countries going ahead of us, but in absolute terms. And that should be a source of worry. When this happened in Germany in the first time, they had PISA shock, it dramatically changed what they did. We don't seem to have much reaction to this. We say, oh, we don't like those kind of tests, so it's not really us. Wow, how blind do we have to be? And certainly we should be looking at, much closely, why it is we're going backwards. And John Ainley has done this work here as part of the ACER, and what I find fascinating from his work is that the major source of the variance in us going backwards is in our top 40% of our kids. You'd never know that from the current rhetoric where we constantly want to go and fix up the tail and there's nothing wrong with fixing up that tail. But in the meantime, we are serving our top 40% of our kids probably the least in our system. When I look at the various states, I have a simple solution for Australia's problems. We'll ship New South Wales to New Zealand. <laughs> it's going down the most, but everyone's going backwards. When I look at who improved, I think it's a fascinating list. There are rich economies, there are poor economies. And certainly there's been a lot of work looking at the kind of reasons that certain countries improve, and I think that's the kind of list we should be on. Unfortunately, but here's the good news, we are not the world's biggest loser. We are the world's fifth biggest loser in the OECD countries. And that's an interesting list in itself. And certainly my observation is that most of those countries have dabbled to various degrees with privatisation, with the school choice debate. It has not served us well, as Jack Keating well predicted and pointed out. It's time for a reboot. More investing in what we're doing can only make that increase, that decrease go down further. We're driving down our maths and science participation. When I asked uh, the federal government recently how much we've spent on scholarships and issues on STEM and science and maths, they started with the word trillions over the last 10 years with this kind of effect. And I get dismayed with the whole debate that's run in the science community. We must have more science and maths graduates. We've got to have our best students going into it. We've got to have talent. And I put it to you that if you read any biography of any famous mathematician or famous scientist, the common theme was that they struggled. They enjoyed the struggle of doing maths and science. And that's the rhetoric that we need in our schools. And there's good evidence coming out that if we want more people to go into maths and science, we've got to stop saying it's only for the brightest, it's only for the best. It's for everyone can struggle. And certainly as I've done many times in my career, gone back to schools, looked at their best students in maths and science in their last years, gone back and see what they were and they started the school, high school, there is not necessarily that high a correlation. But we're closing out our maths and science with our wrong rhetoric. It's also interesting in the US when you look at maths jobs, Overall, maths jobs are declining. Maths graduates with no social skills, it's a chasm. Maths and science students with social skills, it's upwards. We want mathematicians and scientists who can interpret, can communicate, and can be part of a team. What do I see in our schools? Students sitting alone, working alone, doing assignments alone, doing exams alone. That is not the world of the jobs on that market. We need a reboot. We're overly focused on school differences. Can you imagine that I'm running McDonald's here in Australia and I set up another McDonald's just down the road from the other one and I say to the two managers, you are successful to the degree that you steal each other's customers. That's what we do in our schools. 
That's what we say to our principals. Success is when your enrollment increases. And it's a pretty much a zero-sum game. Yes, we do bring new kids in each year, but across, particularly in our high schools, it is a pretty much zero-sum game. And so I think this whole debate that we've given parents over the last 10 years of school choice is unbelievably misleading. <coughs> 10, 15 years ago, Australia was one of the lowest between school variances in the world. Two kids of the same ability, it does not matter what school they go to. So why do we give parents the belief that choosing schools matters? When school choice works, schools do choose. Ha, we've been successful. And the number of kids in this town that cross their local school to go to another school is huge. When you look at the evidence, what makes the difference? The teacher? But no, we don't give them choice of teacher. Probably for all good kinds of reasons in some ways. But the rhetoric that we've had has driven the parents to seek the choice, to therefore like it because they've invested in it. And I'm arguing, following Jack's line, that it's destroying us as a system because it's giving a perverse outcome, not only for the principals, but also in terms of the quality of education that our kids are getting. When I look at, for example, NAPLAN, and I look at government versus independent schools, and don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against independent schools. I have my four sons, two went to government, two went to independent schools. I'm an equal opportunity parent. <laughs> but there's the NAPLAN data. It doesn't matter which year, it's the same with all, that's all schools. Where do you think, if I interposed on that, I color coded in yellow the independent schools, where would they fall? They don't have a tail. Are they any different? I stretch you to find a difference there. But that residualization that Jack talked about is very evident there. Our government schools deal with those kids. Our independent schools deal with a narrower branch. Nothing right, nothing wrong about them. But why do we have a choice, an issue about school choice? It clearly can't be because of the achievement or their learning differences. I would argue this is the biggest problem. We have one in five kids who start high school who do not finish. Now, we could go into great more detail, as Steve Lamb has done in his work, and we could look at the number of people who don't finish by age 20. Those not in employment, education, and training by age 20. It's close to one in four, one in five. If you believe, as Hank Levin argued and demonstrated, he's an economist of education, that the biggest predictor of adult health, wealth, and happiness is not achievement at school. It's the number of years of schooling. And when I hear our Minister of Education in Victoria, 97% of adults in prison in Victoria did not finish high school. Now the cost is ginormous. One in five should be a crime. And you can see it hasn't changed much, thank goodness for Aboriginal kids, because you can see the trend for them is going up. But overall, we still have been stuck for 20 odd years at denying 20% of our kids the kind of health, wealth and happiness that we argue schools are there for. How come we've narrowed down that curriculum and not seen multiple ways, placed, multiple ways to being excellent? And I recall from my New Zealand days, when they identified this problem in the early 2000s, they tried about 10 or 15 things, most of them didn't work, but the one that worked dramatically was they abolished the concept of VCAL and VET, the, the exam systems that we have here. They broadened it dramatically. Universities were very unhappy. And what they found within three years, they went from 80% to 92%. Suddenly people who wanted to be baristas, who wanted to be panel beaters, who wanted to be water polo coaches, said, we can still be excellent. And there's ways to be excellent in the system. We don't have that kind of system here. I think it's time for a reboot. Are we dumbing down teacher education? Well, as you know, there's this moment there is 85, 80 plus thousand uh, people as of today that are in teacher education courses. We know that there are 7,000 who get full-time jobs. We haven't much of a clue about supply and demand, despite what we've been doing for the last 30 years. There is an impression that it's not doing a good job. It is true to say that there's not a hell of a lot of research evidence around it. And part of the role that I have in AIDSL is trying to use the TMAG report as an opportunity to make Australia the world's best 
place for research on teacher education effectiveness. I can assure you, we have no one to beat, because no one's doing it. It is the most evidence-free institutions. We have an incredible amount of talent across those institutions. And how we can get together over this year and next year as we roll out the TMAG reforms to see it as an opportunity. And my challenge to anybody who's going to write the 103rd review of teacher education in Australia over the last 15 years, please let the next one be based on evidence, not opinion. So we have a lot of work to do. And of course, we want to find ways to get our most ablest people to come into teaching. And again, I'm very proud of the fact that I've my seven offspring at this moment, three of them are now teachers. It's wonderful. Inequality, surely. We have slipped down from being in a top quadrant in 2000 and we're slipping down, right down the bottom in terms of the equity chain. This is something that I've raised in the earlier part of the session of how we've got more social stratification, how we're getting our schools to get the, different, the variance between schools is increasing quite a lot over the last 10 years. I want, I want to argue that we should also stop seeing postcode as a destination. We can and we are making a difference. Let me use, for example, the Aboriginal kids. This came out of the Productivity Commission, that report that was released last week, looking at the NAPLAN figures. What they're pointing out that 77% of all our primary schools have at least one Indigenous kid. This is not a problem just for remote and rural Australia. The majority of the Indigenous kids go to school in regional metropolitan and provincial regions in New South Wales and Queensland. And look at the distribution. The red, the indigenous, the blue, the non-indigenous. And the thing I particularly want to point out is the gap on that side. There is just as many Aboriginal kids above the average who are not being served well by our school system. And of course, you and I also want to worry about the kids below the average, but who's worrying about those kids above? who are going to be the future of their nations and our nations. How do we change that narrative? How do we abolish the word, there's a problem with Aboriginal education? What a racist comment. There's a problem with our way of teaching those kids. Because we are many situations around Australia where we can have success with those kids. It's our problem. And I certainly work on the principle of Russell Bishop's principle. If we all teach kids where Aboriginal kids are the beneficiaries, all kids are the beneficiaries, but it doesn't work the other way around. And I look particularly tonight at the Cape York schools. And I know they're in hot in the media at the moment with the Arakud situation. And about four years ago, I said to Noel Pearson when I met him, Noel, what you're doing sounds great, but you sound like everybody else. You've got a program and you want everyone to use it. Where's the evidence of the impact on your kids? He said, well, it's tough. I said, well, that's your business. And he said, we've tried this and we've tried this. And I foolishly said to him, Noel, send me your data. He did. This is the story, guys. There's four schools up there. Yes, they use a particular model of teaching that a lot, a lot of people like, but does it work? They're gaining three times more than the rest of Australia in reading and numeracy and two times more in writing. What an incredible success story. And when you read the debate in the newspapers over the last few weeks about it not working, you've got to say, well, what's not working? Now, here's the not so good news. Noel, if your kids are going to catch up, they're going to have to do four or five times the rate of the rest of Australia. So he's not there yet, and he knows that. And he's putting in other kinds of programs to speed up that. But the other point I want to make is we can teach those kids extremely well. Postcode, remote, is not necessarily the problem. It is having that constant focus on the impact that you're having on your kids. And I think that's pretty impressive, and I do not understand why often many of the same people who are offering similar kinds of programs, not with the same name, in the similar areas, are throwing bows and arrows at Noel and his group, where <coughs> the politics in that area I know is really incredible. But again, isn't it interesting? Evidence may not win, and evidence should win. I'm impressed. Five years ago, the Northern Territory came to us and said, we kind of like what you're doing in your visible learning stuff. We want you to do some trials here. So initially they gave us all the schools around the Alice Springs. No surprise, the model that I use is an evidence-based one. We look at the evidence on the impact of the kids. Yes, we care obviously about the teachers' views, but we privilege the impact they have. And then after a year, 
Northern Territory said, like what we see, we want to give you all 500 schools. So we've been writing and working in 500 schools. What we do is we go in and we start off by doing a good old-fashioned needs analysis. One of the things I've discovered in this business is if you ask people to come into schools, they've always got answers. Beware of educators with solutions. They may not fit the problem. And getting the schools to recognise what the particular problems were. Now, the wise thing we did, as it turned out, is we asked the school to fill in this matrix. And we used a kind of a traffic light system where we said, well, what's going on here? And it was a really fascinating debate where the principal said, no, oh, it's green. And the rest of the staff said, well, actually, that's not true in my class. And so building the trust for this to happen. Here's what it looked like four years ago. Not a very healthy situation at all. And this was the teachers and the principal's own judgments. Here's what it looked like a year later. Here's th three years later, and here's four years later. It can be done. You can make a difference in the practice of those schools and in the effects it has on kids. And one of the simple things we do is no matter which school you go to in the territory now, they speak a common language about influence, about impact. Of course it's a problem but we're trying to mitigate the problem that the average tenure of a teacher and a principal in the Northern Territory is eight months. So what kids do is they wait the eight months for the next wave to come through. Now there is one wave in terms of a common language. And when kids switch schools, as they do a lot, there's a common language. Now we're not there yet, because clearly we've done the first part for three years. Now we have to really capitalize on top of that. But my point here this evening is that we can teach those kids. The inequities that we talk about, the postcodes, are not necessarily the problem, except in the minds of the beholders. So it's time for a reboot. How do we keep some of the good stuff? That's what I want to come on to. And how do we change that fundamental narrative that I'm arguing this evening is going in the wrong direction? And I invite you to watch, particularly over the next two weeks when the media gets really hot about the election, but what the narrative is there. I'm afraid it's a lot of that early stuff. The first thing I want to do is to bring back the notion of expertise. It is just not true that all teachers are equal. That doesn't mean to say we have bad teachers. I ask you to look at that list. And I ask you to think, in terms of the rhetoric, what do you think most teachers, as it turns out, but certainly most parents, most adults say make the difference in that list. I put it to you that the majority of things on this chart are the things we debate and they are all incredibly trivial in terms of their impact. Those effect sizes are tiny but they dominate our debates. Now just look at those numbers, the numbers, meaning of them is not critical tonight because the next slide is going to show you a contrast of what does matter and look at the dramatic difference when expertise is put on the table. So how do we build a profession that acknowledges its expertise? How do we get teachers and school principals to not deny their expertise? Get them involved in doing this. And that's part of what I love to see happen, what I'm trying to do here in Australia. Bring that back into the equation. One of the things we have in Aitzel is we have four levels of certification. And at the moment, with our teacher education focus, we've looked very closely at being classroom ready. How are you ready to change the learning lives of students? But I'm also putting a lot of focus on the top two ends. Now, the acronym isn't very healthy, HALTS, but how do we highly accomplished and lead? And last November, I wrote to every highly accomplished and lead teacher in Australia. And what teachers have to do is they have to pay an amount of money, they have to submit certain materials, it's then evaluated at a, a local state level, and AITSL has the role of moderating across the states. And I wrote to every one of them, I invited them to a workshop in Adelaide a couple of months ago. I got the minister to open it, and he was there instantly and said, I want to privilege expertise. We asked them many times during the two days, what can we best help you with? What do you think they said? These are all our highly accomplished and lead teachers. What can we best help you with? Wouldn't it be nice, they said, if our principals recognised we existed? 
Wouldn't it be nice if the school actually knew how to use us? Wouldn't it be nice if someone come up and said, wow, well done? That was said by virtually a lot of them constantly. Wow, why do we deny our expertise? Now let's put this in perspective. There's only 300 of them. There was none from Victoria. You don't play the system. You have a system of doing performance analysis such that 99.97% of teachers get anger increments on the basis of performance. Do you believe that? One of the things I'm particularly pleased about is New South Wales and, and South Australia have now created positions that you can't apply for unless you're a highly accomplished lead teacher. What an obvious way to solve the teacher pay problem. None of this performance pay nonsense, which has never worked in any system in the world and wouldn't work in any other pro profession. Can you imagine going up to doctors and say, we're going to pay you by the amount of people that you, you keep alive and keep well? Who would deal with the sick people? But if you turn it on its head and say we're going to pay and value expertise, because we really should be worried with a teacher pay salary scheme that is so flat. Within 10 years, you're at the top of the salary range. Oh, Alicia, don't listen to that. But we want you to go longer than 10 years. And if I ask most of you in the room who are teachers, if you spent $100,000 of your own money this year to improve your own teaching, who would notice? We have to notice. And so I have this mission now with the Holtz, a very energetic group. They've created their own little um, society now. They've got a mission this year to have at least one other person in their school become a Holt. They want to drive their numbers up. I'm talking to Victoria, I'm talking to Queensland about how they can come into this fold, about how across this nation we can start to reintroducing the notion of expertise. Now, we want to make sure we do it and we don't imply to a parent that if your kid doesn't have a highly accomplished or lead teacher, they're getting second best. In the same way that when you go to your GP, oh, you're not a surgeon, I don't want to talk to you. We have to get that balance right. And certainly, if I have my druthers in 2018, when we relook at the uh, eight or standards, I'd like to put more in the lead and highly accomplished teachers in terms of their role to help graduate and proficient teachers. I also put it out there. Would you be happy if a lead teacher got paid more than the principal? Would you be happy to do what Singapore and other countries have done where we ask teachers early in their career to decide whether they want to aspire to be lead teachers or they want to go into management. Why can't we find ways to keep some of our best in the classroom? It can be done. We can reboot. I come back to this notion of impact. And to me, it's a contested word. We cannot have it that each teacher has their own belief about what progress means what their interpretation of difficulty means. And certainly as I've done over my career, get teachers to bring along examples of what do they think of a year five or a year six work, put it on the table. Wow, what a fascinating that debate is when the year five teacher looks at the year six teacher and says, well, I assumed they had that before they came in here. Their expectations are very powerful. It's very hard to have those conversations. It requires a lot of skill. Then we want to go to the next point of saying, is that impact good enough? Bring along two pieces of work three months apart. Can we agree this is three months, this is evidence of three months' work? Again, a very difficult conversation, but the discussion we must have. And the equity issue is how many kids in this class and in the school are getting this impact? Now, certainly, test scores don't answer it alone. If you only have test scores, in my view, you fail. If you don't use test scores, you fail. It's getting that mix right, the triangulation, the preponderance of evidence of what we mean by growth. Let's have a robust discussion. Let's not have another curriculum that decides how much stuff we're going to shove in and how we can sequence it according to some adult group think. Let's look at the impact we're having on kids and ask, is it good enough? Do we have common conceptions of what progress means? This is a new number one in visible learning. Top of the charts. And I love it. Teacher collective efficacy. And it fits nicely with the argument I'm making here tonight that if teachers could work together to have the confidence they can change every kid in the school, increases the rate of learning by a factor of four. Now, of course, if you're going to maintain this efficacy, you've got to have evidence to keep maintaining it. So it's a lovely virtuous circle. But it very much does start, again, about that notion of what teachers' mind frames are, how they think, what they think is good enough. Let's not keep that a private notion. Let's try and have this debate. 
Also, there is a whole trend coming. And be careful, it's got lots of fancy names. 21st century skills. You know, we're almost a fifth of the way through. We better get busy, guys. <laughs> Metacognition, self-regulation. Am I worry, and it's already happening in countries of the world where they're adding collaborative problem solving to their curricula. Why are they adding that? Well, that's the PISA test that's going across all nations this year. It's developed by Patrick Griffith and the team here. We know a lot about that test. Certainly our work, and we've just finished in our Science of Learning lab, a metasynthesis of not quite 300 million, it's only about 40 million kids looking at how they learn, the learning strategies. And one of the findings which has been very, very clear is that you can only teach those strategies within the content matter. Teaching collaborative problem solving, creative thinking, um, critical thinking, and all that as a separate curriculum, well, it works dramatically, but it's got no transfer into any of the subject matter. Probably the best example is working memory. There's a lot of schools doing working memory training. Kids love it. They get better at doing those games, but it has a zero transfer to maths and science and English and panel meeting. How do we bring the knowing how and the knowing that together? And I think it's really interesting in Australia, in fact, most of the Western world, we have thousands, millions of tests of achievement. How many assessments we do have we that can help teachers understand how we think, how kids are thinking, what kind of strategies they're using? What do they know? What do they do when they don't know what to do? And unfortunately, we privilege those kids who learn it somehow, and those who don't, we have lots of categories and labels for them. And my argument is we can have a very robust discussion on how we teach the knowing how and the knowing that together. <clears throat> As part of the um, Revolution School, the ABC, Alex is here, did a survey of 1,000 adults. Half of them had kids in schools and half of them didn't. And they asked them what would make the biggest difference to kids learning. Now you look at that list. You compare it with the list I put up before. Hey guys, we've got to stop appeasing the parents. If we give them what they want through the ballot box and through the Gonski funding, we're going to make our quality of our lives for our kids even worse because none of those make a difference. How do we turn it around? And I invite you to recall, those of you who are grey enough, 15, 20 years ago, governments weren't in the business of looking at outcomes of schooling. They were in the business of resourcing, setting up schools. It was um, in the late 90s, uh, with Bill Clinton started the whole notion in the US that maybe the government should get involved in looking at outcomes. It's a very recent phenomenon. And I trace it very much also to the decline here in Australia over the last 10 or 20 years as we've switched our focus from how do we get the best out of our kids to how do we appease our parents. And again, I invite you over the next two weeks to listen to the politics. Hardly ever will you hear about the impact of children. You'll hear about these things, which are appeasing the voters. And certainly if I look through as I've done in the US, those states where there are more adults who don't have kids in schools, the funding drops dramatically. And we're heading in that direction. If we don't change that narrative, we need to reboot that narrative. The Revolution School. And I'm delighted in the front row, we have teachers from Cambria. It was a very risky decision you guys took a year and a half ago to have cameras in your school every day of the school year. I say cameras plural, have some cameras fixed in some of your offices and see the whole life of schools. Some of us were very nervous. Well, you've seen, I hope, three of the four episodes and please watch tonight. It is the best episode. It's where the data is revealed. It's where Michael talks about the stunning things that have happened in that school. I have to say I was a bit nervous after episode one. I thought, oh, the reaction is going to be, why would I want to send my kid to a school like that? But as the ABC monitors very closely, the overwhelming 98% plus of the reactions were positive. And the reactions were positive in a very simple way. Wow, what expertise. Look at what these teachers do. They don't have to teach the kids, they have to deal with some of the parents in interesting ways. Kids bring raging hormones, they bring problems to schools. They have to deal with those things. And in the meantime, you saw the quality of the investment and the passion of those teachers and the impacts, as you'll see tonight, that those kids are having. I want a new campaign. I think Michael Musket for Australian of the Year. <laughs> now, 
I know Michael, he'd be the first to say there are many schools like his. He'd be the first to say there are many principals and teachers that do that. And that is absolutely the case. How do once again we get that privileged? Why is it that the army and the police and the business community are very good each year at getting people on the honours list and we never see a teacher or a principal? How do we bring that expertise back? You've seen it. It's done an incredibly opportune time to have a debate about how we, how we fund that expertise, not appease the parents. Here's some of their results, and you'll see this tonight. This was their school five years ago. The kids were very connected to each other and they were highly motivated to be connected with each other. But look at the but data about learning. No wonder the school said, doing more of the same is not solving the problem. What's the data now? Wow. They rebooted, they were successful, they might not have appeased many of their parents who wanted more school uniforms, smaller class sizes and all that list. They focused on their kids and the impact they had on their kids. It can be done, it is being done, but we're in crisis of losing it if we continue the current narrative. Here's the issue. When I walk into the nine ministers around the country, director generals, of course we talk about high achievement and we all want high achievement. But I put it to you, that's not primarily what our schools are there to maximise. But I still want high achievement. Schools are there to add value. No matter where the kid starts, struggling or bright, they all deserve at least a year's growth. But I also know from talking to those ministers, they also agree, oh yes, we want high progress. When I walk out of the room, it's back to high achievement. And as I argued at the beginning using Jack's words, that narrative of high academic excellence is what's killing us. I can name each of those segments, you could probably name them too. And certainly when we work with schools, one of the first things we do is say, where are you in that chart? Because no matter where you are in that chart, it determines how you grow to be an optimal school. Of course, we want all schools to be high progress and high growth. Here's what I want to change. The current narrative say that's our good schools, high achieving schools. I say to you, that is not what we want to maximise. When I spoke recently to the um, National Independent Schools um, Principals Association, I put the data up, I showed them how many more independent schools are in the cruising zone compared to others. Now it's not true to say, but it did feel at the time that the reaction was, so? Our kids get high v ATARs, they get into universities. But you're the ones, more than any, that are holding our nation back and is causing our decline, our top 40%. Now to be fair to them, I have spoken to them since, they are taking this on, and whether they're adopting the word cruising schools or what, it's trying to get down more deep to understand that every kid needs that year growth. Because what I want to do is I want to change the rhetoric to say those are our best schools. And many of our schools, as I certainly shown here in, in Melbourne, out in our west, who are over here, are in this zone. Some stunning schools. But unfortunately, with the high achievement rhetoric, they're still, oh, but you're not good enough. And I happened to go into a school here in Melbourne, not so long ago, where almost unbelievably, it was in the top five growth schools five years in a row. No, it wasn't up the top. It was coming out here. A new principle. And what do new principles do? Change. But I said, but wait a moment. Have you looked at your data? You're one of the top five in the country. You've been the top five five years in a row. No, we're not up there. That principle systematically destroyed the best school in, in Victoria because she wanted high achievement. Now, if she had her way, she would have gone out and chosen the kids she wanted. And that's the rhetoric we have at the moment. Those schools are, I think, stunning schools. I want to look at one state for a moment. Uh, so I'm going to look at the whole country. This is an app for the whole country, year three to five. And that's how you plot them. Now, in some ways we can be delighted. There's not a hang of a lot of schools down in that disaster area. But once again, you can see by age three to five, it's that top half of the population that we're least serving. And we're actually much better with kids below the average. I want those up there to come across as well. 
how do I get that rhetoric on the table? How do I get a reboot to see that all kids need that top, that year's growth? When I go to high schools, very, very similar. Kind of less in the disaster zone. But quite frankly, 50, 60% of our schools in this country, I would say, are excellent schools. Could they get better? Yeah, could get better. Everyone can get better. But at least they're in the right zone, this zone. How do we reboot our narrative so that high progress leading to high achievement is what we esteem in our schools? Let me go to my last of the data, and this is um, from Tasmania, where I presented recently, and it's a really fascinating case. When you ask what's the correlation between reading or mathematics or writing and socioeconomic status, it's pretty high, around 0.58, 0.6. No surprise in many ways. But look at the correlation with growth, close to zero. And look at the school out here. Just isn't it, maybe coincidence, the lowest Ixia score, the lowest socioeconomic status school in Tasmania is the 11th best school. Wow. Now, I know the debate in Tasmania Barbara's here, she could uh, uh, reinforce this. It's all about, oh, we have rural schools, we have postcode problems. I'm sorry. All kids in Tasmania can learn, and teachers can teach those kids very successfully despite that postcode. Look at that school. And you can read it right across the Ixi school, some of our richest schools in Tasmania are far below some of those others. It isn't SES. And I've shown you the Aboriginal figures. Those Aboriginal kids can learn. Wow, they're pretty stunning learners. How do we turn that rhetoric around to recognise that learning and get away from the narrative of we've got to have high achievement? It's intriguing that we don't have resources for teachers to do that. And I challenge any school in this nation to show me how they actually measure progress using assessment tools at their fingertips. It's very, very tough. 20 years ago in New Zealand, we developed an assessment scheme for schools. And these are the reports from them that show teachers what their concept of a year's growth for a year's input was. It showed them which kids were learning, which kids were on the various dimensions of those graphs I've pointed out. It's a voluntary system. Schools don't have to use it. And I'm very proud of the fact that today, 80% of schools and teachers in New Zealand voluntarily use this assessment scheme 16 years later. Who would miss NAPLAN if it went? How do we turn it around to help teachers do their job and I love the fact that it's voluntary. Teachers are hungry for information about progress. We need to give it to them. That's part of my mission. How do we open classrooms to collaboration? When we ask teachers, how often do you talk in your classroom? You can see the yellow figures there, what teachers say, 30 to 40 percent. The same teachers when we monitor them, 59 to 60 percent. In fact, the study Janet did in England last year never happened here, the average talking time of teachers in a classroom was 89%. I'm an academic, it's 100. <laughs> what chance have we of listening to learning? What does it say to the students? Come to school and watch the teachers work. How do we turn that around? And so what we've been working on on the team is to say, can we come up with a methodology? Now, video, it's incredibly powerful, but it's expensive. And it takes a lot of time to analyse that incredible amount of data. It's not just in time. Having someone in the back of the room, and be careful, it's a wave coming this way. It's coming through America and the UK. Incredible amount of effort gone into classroom observation. Someone in the back of the room. We know that it takes five observations of the same lesson to get sufficient reliability to believe it. That's not going to happen, is it? We know that there's an incredible amount of biases. So the team said, how do we come up with a solution? So we can now, as is happening right as we speak, we can go into almost any classroom in the world. We've been in around 7,000, mainly in the UK and the US, and we can monitor what happens within three seconds and put back on the kid's iPad or their own iPhone everything the teacher says. At the same time, we can ask the kids to rate their learning on their iPads, and that can be fed back instantly. By the end of the lesson, the teachers can see their transcript, usually that thick. They can then get all that coding done so they can see actually what's happening. And the delightful news is that 50 to 60% of the teachers who do two hours of this visible classroom work over five weeks improve their learning. Another 20% who really do need to learn change dramatically. 
but there's still about 20% who dramatically need to learn, who just ignore it all and go back, do what they're doing. So we've got work to do yet. But my point is, we can now open up classrooms. Wouldn't it be great if we actually had some dialogues in our school about what actually happened in the classroom, not what the teachers believed? As Graham Nuttall showed, 80% of what happens in the classroom, a teacher does not see or hear. So why do we talk about all this teacher reflection rubbish? where they only reflect on the 20% they saw. How can we get them to reflect on the evidence of their impact with their kids? And I think it's an exciting world we live in with the tools we have now available where we can create those debates in real time right now just for me. And it is starting to make a difference. So this is some of the, the learning analytics they get from this. And right now, the team uh, led by Janet has now got 140 schools in England doing a randomised control trial. England is far past us in looking at the evidence stakes. I'm not saying that's the only method, and I'm certainly not going to argue it's the gold standard. But if you want to convince policymakers, it's not a bad way to do it. And certainly what I'm trying to do with um, Social Ventures Australia is to introduce that kind of evidence base, and that's available now on the website here in Australia. It's all been Australianised, to put Australianised research in it, to try and say what are the things that really make the difference. I'm also keen that we develop a parallel site where schools that trial these interventions. Talk about what worked, what didn't work, their enablers and barriers. So we can start to build up a science of implementation. It seems crazy to me that we say to principals, go out and pluck something out of the year, probably you've done it in another school, introduce it in this school, and it'll work. Or the government's saying, we're going to do X now, away you go. Where's the implementation science? Where's the fidelity of the implementation? How do we build that up as principles? I think it can be done. And we need to start early. And I go back to look at the incredible trillions. Well, how come we waste so much money in this business? On our early childhood sector. And as Colette Taylor and his team have shown, if you rate three or 4,000 early childhood settings across Australia on a dimensions of emotional and uh, social development, they score seven or eight. On cognitive, two or three. How do we bring the concept of learning in? And I'm not talking about teaching two or threes to read or write. I'm talking about language, 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 and language. And when you look at some of the figures there, of the difference even at the age of three, uh, these are not my words, professional working class or welfares, and if Jack was here, he'd be the first one to tell me off using those words. I'm using it from the study. Look at the difference already at age three. And when you look down at kids who start school with 500 words, and the stu this study took out kids who started with 6,000 words, you can see the difference at age 11, but look at it at age 16. It's dramatic. And certainly we looked at what's called the Matthew effect. By age eight, if kids haven't got to level two in NAPLAN, those who, do, who have got there do well, those who don't never catch up. Oh my goodness, it's true. That's why I put as one of my mission statements, how do we get kids at least to level two NAPLAN by age eight, which means we are gonna to have to start earlier. So folks, I wanna change the narrative. I wanna reboot. I've tried to argue this evening that doing more of the same is going in the wrong direction. I've tried to argue this evening that appeasing the current debate, particularly what the parents are asking for, and don't get me wrong, I'll include the teachers. Again, it wouldn't happen here. It was a UK study of two weeks ago. 5,000 teachers. What's the one thing highest on your list that would make the biggest difference to the quality of the impact on your kids? 79% said reduce class size. The next, number two, 29%, was pay us more. Wow, we have a major problem. We know the effect of reducing class size, and as Andrew Schleicher shows, you can go through that list of countries I put up there before that are on the list that are going down. How much they've invested in the structural things, which is why they're going down. Whereas the countries at the top of the list, as he's shown, and many other groups have shown, they've invested in teacher expertise. They're going up. How do we change this narrative? Yes, Gonski money. It costs. Do I want it? My fear is we, if we got it, we'd frit it away. We'd invest in the things that don't work. I want the money to invest in expertise. And I'm dismayed, but I know I have no control over this, that in our current election debate, it's all about the money, not what you do with it. If we get it and misuse it, as we have done over the last 10 or 12 years, to the tune of trillions of dollars, sooner or later, 
Our community is going to say, as in many other countries in the world, that's it. We're not going to fund you anymore. We're going to come up with Band-Aid solutions. We're going to privilege those who have and those who don't have, we're going to blame them with all kinds of things. How come, how can we be in a situation where we lose an incredible amount of the excellence we have? So yes, I give a Godski, but I'd love to know how it's used. I'd love to know in the current debates with federal and state, I look at the states that have got the Godski money. Some states, and I think New South Wales is a good example, have used it very wisely in many respects, even though they're struggling at times with how they implement some of that stuff. But that's what I want to attend to, is how do we get that narrative right so the money's spent on the same thing? Certainly the argument is more of the same is not what we need. Expertise is what it's all about. Our biggest enemy is complacency. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, as usual, you have challenged us, and you've particularly, I think, challenged the um, often anecdotally informed narratives that are feeding a lot of the policies and practices uh, across this country and others. And um, I really appreciate the way that you've not just challenged those narratives, you've provided evidence to, to um, redirect our thinking of what are the really, really important things. And um, I also totally support the idea of teacher expertise. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do, I think, in developing that, both in initial teacher education and in ongoing work and recognising that expertise. And I'm also particularly thrilled with the focus on progress um, as opposed to a particular level of achievement because I think that's where the individual teacher comes in and can make a huge difference. So um, I, I really appreciate the sort of uh, information that you've given us tonight, the challenge that you've given out to us. Uh, I'm delighted that the Australian College of Educators um, can partner with Melbourne Graduate School of Education to be part of these um, lectures. And I'm sure Jack Keating and his family would be delighted in what you've talked about tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you.